Hi, we've just finished class three and here are some of the issues that arose. Uh, I got a list of them here. Uh, so let's start at the top. Numeric precision in activities has caused a little bit of unnecessary angst. Uh, so we've simplified our policy and in general we're asking you to round your percentages to the nearest integer. Certainly don't want you typing in those four decimal places because that kind of accuracy is misleading. Uh, some people are getting the wrong results with Weka. One reason why you might get the wrong results is that the random seed is uh, not set to the default value. Whenever you change the random seed, it stays there until you change it back or until you restart Weka. So uh, just restart Weka or reset the random seed to 1. And another thing uh, you should do is to check your version of Weka. We asked you to download 3.6.10. There have been some bug fixes since the previous version, so you really do need to use this new version. One of the uh, activities uh, asked you to copy an attribute. And uh, some people uh, found some surprising things with Weka claiming 100% accuracy. You know, if you accidentally ask Weka to predict something that's already there as an attribute, it's, it'll do very well with very high accuracy. It's very easy to mislead yourself when you're doing data mining. So you just need to make sure that uh, you know what you're trying to predict and you know what the attributes are and you haven't accidentally included a copy of the class attribute as one of the attributes, attributes that's being used for prediction. There have been some discussion uh, on the mailing list about whether 1R is really always better than 0R on the training set. And uh, in fact, it is. Uh, someone proved it. Thank you, Jurek, for sharing that proof with us. Uh, someone else found a counterexample. Uh, if we had a data set with 10 instances, 6 belonging to class A and 4 belonging to class B, will attribute values with attribute values selected randomly, wouldn't 0R zero, zero outperform 1R? 1R would be fooled by the randomness of attribute values. Now this is kind of anthropomorphic to talk about 1R being fooled by things. It's not fooled by anything. It's not a person. It's not a being. It's just an algorithm. So it just gets an input and does its thing with, uh, with the data. Uh, so if you think that 1R might be fooled, then why don't you try it? You know, set up this data set uh, um, with 10 instances, 6 in A and 6 in B, and select the attributes uh, randomly and see what happens. I think you'll be able to convince yourself quite easily that this counter example isn't a counter example at all. It is definitely true that 1R is always better than 0R on the training set. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be better on an independent test set, of course. Okay, so the next thing is uh, activity 3.3 asked you to repeat attributes with naive maze. And uh, some people said, why? Why are we doing this? Well, it's just an exercise. You know, we're just uh, trying to understand naive maze a bit better and what happens uh, when you get highly correlated attributes like repeated attributes. So with naive maze, enough repetitions mean that the other attributes won't matter at all. This is because all attributes contribute equally to the decision. So multiple copies of an attribute skew it in that direction. This is not true with other learning algorithms. So it's true for Naive Bayes, but it's not true for 1R or J48, for example. Copying attributes doesn't affect 1R at all. So the copying exercise is just to illustrate what happens with Naive Bayes when you have non-independent attributes. It's not something you do in real life. although. You might copy an attribute in order to transform it in some way, for example. Uh, someone asked uh, the mathematics. In Bayes' formula, you'd get uh, PR of e given h to the power k if the attribute was repeated k times in the top line. How did this work mathematically? Well, first of all, I should say that the uh, Bayes' formulation assumes independent attributes. 
So uh, Bayes' expansion is not true if the attributes are dependent. But the algorithm works off that, and so let's see what would happen. Here's, if you can stomach a bit of mathematics here, here's the uh, equation for the probability of the hypothesis given the evidence. H might be play as yes or play as no, for example, in the weather data. That is equal to this fairly complicated formula at the top, which let me just simplify by writing dot, dot, dots for all of the bits after here. So PR of E1 dot H, uh, given H, sorry, to the power K, where E1 is repeated K times, times all of the other stuff, divided by PR of E. So what the algorithm does is to, because we don't know PR of E, we normalize the two probabilities by calculating PR of yes given E using this formula and PR of no given E and making and renormalizing them so that they add up to one. So that uh, then computes PR of yes given E as this thing here, which is the top up here, PR of E1 given yes to the K divided by that same thing plus the corresponding thing for no. So now if you look, about this, look at this formula, just forget about the dot, dot, dots. What's going to happen? These probabilities are less than 1. So if we take them to the kth power, they're going to get very small as k gets big. In fact, they're going to approach 0. But one of them is going to approach 0 faster than the other one. So whichever one is bigger, if this is bigger, the yes one is bigger than the no one, then it's going to dominate. And uh, the normalized probability then is going to be 1 if the yes uh, probability is bigger than the no probability, otherwise 0. So that's, actually, that's what's actually going to happen to this formula as k approaches infinity. And the result is as though there's only one attribute, E1. So that's a sort of a mathematical explanation of what happens when you copy attributes in naive Bayes. Don't worry if you didn't follow that. It was just for someone who asked. I just wanted to say that. Uh, decision trees and those bits. So someone said on the mailing list, in the lecture there was a condition that resulted in branches with all yes or all no results, completely determining things. Why was the information gain only 0.791 and not the full one bit? This is the picture they were talking about. And here humidity determines these are all no's and these are all yes's for normal humidity, no's for high humidity. And when you calculate the gain ratio, and this actually, sorry, when you calculate the information gain, and this is the formula for information gain, you get 0.971 bits. You might expect one, I agree. And you would get one if you had three no's and three yeses here. Or if you had two no's and two yeses here, you would get one. But because there's a slight imbalance between the number of no's and the number of yeses, you don't actually get one bit under these circumstances. Class two, there were some questions on class two about stratified Cross-validation, stratified cross-validation tries to get the same proportion of class values in each fold. So someone suggested maybe you should choose the number of folds so that it can do this exactly instead of approximately. If you chose the number of folds, the, uh, an exact divisor of the number of elements in each class, you'd be able to do this uh, exactly. And would that be a good thing to do, was the question. And the answer is no, not really. These things are all estimates. and you're kind of treating them as though they're exact answers. They're all just estimates. There are more important considerations to take into account when you're deciding on the number of folds to do in your cross-validation. Like, you know, you want a large enough test set to get an accurate uh, estimate of the uh, classification performance, and you want a large enough training set to train the classifier adequately. adequately. So don't worry about stratification being approximate. The whole thing is pretty approximate, actually. Uh, someone else asked, why is there a used training set on the classify tab? It's very misleading to take seriously the uh, evaluation you get on the training data, as we know. So why is it there in Weka? Well, you know, uh, we might want it there for some purposes. For example, it does give you a quick upper bound on an algorithm's performance. You couldn't possibly do better than you do on the training set, and that might be useful in allowing you to quickly reject a learning algorithm. 
Anyway, you know, the important thing here is to understand what's wrong with using the training set for a performance estimate and what overfitting is. I would rather protect you rather than changing the interface so you can't do bad things. I'd rather protect you by educating you about what the issues are here. There have been quite a few suggested topics for a follow-up course. Attribute selection, clustering, the experimenter, parameter optimization, the knowledge flow interface, symbol command line interface, and we're considering a uh, follow-up course and we'll be asking you for feedback on that at the end of this course. Finally, someone said, uh, please let me know if there is a way to make a small donation. He's enjoying the course so much. Well, thank you very much. We will make sure there is a way to make a small donation at the end of the course. Okay, that's it for now. On with Class 4. I hope you enjoy Class 4, and we'll talk to you later. Bye for now.